Okay, from Macquarie, we put our preferences in the chat and we're so excited for the debate. Good luck, everyone. Okay. All right, two preliminary notes. We have a lot of observers. If the observers guarantee have to make sure they leave the cameras off because it'll reject the screen in front of me and it'll just be really discombobulating. Secondarily, I'm real shit with time entering time signals. I am timing. I have the time kit app at things. It's right next to me. I'm just really bad at fine motor skills and entering it, but you guys obviously should be timing yourself and I trust you guys will do that for both you and your opponents. And third of all, this obviously is a very high detox room and just like don't fuck up. Good luck, Prime Minister or First Half. Hi, can I be heard? Uh, I'll take that as a yes. Okay. Let me just turn on my camera. Also, it, okay, uh, I'm hoping the answer is a no, but do people hear like music from my neighbors? No. Okay, they're playing like. Fine. They're playing like annoyingly loud Filipino pop. Uh, you can Google it on your own, I guess, if you want to hear, to simulate what it's like to be in my house. In any case, I'll start my speech in three, two, one. First, setup. Belarus generally regrets this because it has plunged many people in this place into poverty. Um, the crisis has substantially decreased the presence of companies in the area, has just generally made the place more unstable and unsafe. First. What does it cost Belarus to manufacture this crisis? Allowing for an unprecedented number of Middle Eastern refugees to fly into Belarus and then now having to deal with the fallout of them being trapped in that country for prolonged periods of time. Note, Belarus has had to pay commercial airlines to incentivize them to even fly these routes in the first place. And the tightening of border controls, not just by Poland, but by every other bordering country that fears Belarus will do the same to them, which means the restrictions on the flow of goods and services and restrictions on the mobility of the Belarusian people. The interests of Belarus are not the interests of Lukashenko or his administration alone. Otherwise, we think the motion would specify that. We think more representative of Belarus as a whole is the perspective of the general, Bel Be general Belarusian populace and their quality of life. What is a counterfactual? Since manufacturing the crisis was done as a misguided attempt to get leverage over the EU, and since their interests were primarily to improve the economic conditions to force the EU to lift sanctions, the other way Belarus was likely to have done this was instead to warm the EU conditions, maintain economic ties, even at the cost of some political concessions like the release of political prisoners. Why is this true? First, this was the persistent demand of oligarchs Lukashenko relied on to stay in power anyway, so he would have had to do have, had to warm relations with the EU somehow. Clearly, this failed, and so the alternative would be to do something else. And beyond that, outsized democratic pressures and a growing opposition to Lukashenko's admin to warm up the EU. Note that they're not going to do something else that's like incredibly weird to force the EU to bow down because of the fact that they had to manufacture a border crisis, which proves that they didn't have the military or economic power to do anything else extraordinary to gain leverage, which is why the alternative would have been to buckle to this pressure and accede to the EU. Having said that, Argument one, this strategy has failed at achieving Belarus's goals and the counterfactual we set out would be better achieved. First of all, this was a short-term threat that is currently losing its teeth. Why? One, it's getting more and more difficult to do because many EU nations and involved nations simply refuse to cooperate. Turkey, which is where most refugees go because they are a country caught in between Europe and the Middle East, has banned commercial flights orchestrated by Belarus. Many other countries have, have, have started to build border walls and have, locked, have entrenched border patrols to ensure that this border crisis doesn't happen anymore. Two, refugee quotas. Perhaps even if Belarus could sustain this for a long period of time, the burden would have been very large. But the fact that EU countries have to distribute these responsibilities and disperse the costs has actually made it substantially easier to weather the storm for many of these countries like Poland. And third is that there's a bad precedence, right? The EU could simply not listen to the Belarus decision because this would encourage other states that are in a similar position to do this as well. So the potential for or, an Orban, for example, in Hungary or a Central Asian state to do the same strategy is a fear for the EU, which is why they have been persistently denying Belarus's attempts to get them to leverage, to, to like decrease sanctions and instead have reapplied many of these sanctions or doubled down on them. Neg might claim that the EU looks complacent in the midst of a humanitarian crisis, but note that they have managed to frame this instead as a manufactured Belarusian attempt at power and that the relative media and rhetorical power of all EU member states have is far greater and far more convincing than an individual country on Belarus. So the EU has been left to a decision to count out the Belarus and give them what they want or see if they can weather the storm. And it has been increasingly clear that the latter is instead true, that they have massively imposed sanctions on Belarus, that they have started to set up border walls, and that this uh, strategy from Belarus has been widely unsuccessful in getting its express goals. The impact of this argument is that Belarus's intent to pull the EU apart and manipulate this policy towards Belarus's favor has failed. And it's an EU policy has become stricter against Belarus by employing sanctions, tightening borders, and making 
more and more difficult for Belarus to gain allies. Our counterfactual would instead be trivially better at, at achieving this conclusion. One, because it aligns incentives with the EU who also want to buy Belarusian products at cheaper prices. So they have an incentive to mutually lower sanctions and to things like existing economic agreements that could be used to leverage this, like the entrance into the Eastern partnerships that Belarus had in like 2014 or 2015, that would allow them to improve economic conditions once the previous deterioration of, uh, of conditions had stopped. So the first obvious point is that this has simply failed as a strategy, made things worse, and that the com comparative would be better. Secondly, this is also economically devastated Belarus. Note that the threshold burden for this argument is not that the counterfactual would be better, but simply that doing nothing would have been better than actively doing harm to the economy of Belarus. For this, we have three reasons for why this destroyed Belarus's economy. First of all, massive direct costs. The main method of transferring refugees was incredibly expensive because it required commercial airlines from either conflict-ridden states like Iraq and Syria or refugee havens like Turkey. Belarus had to incentivize airlines to such an extent that they could recuperate the cost of potential shutdowns or backlash, which cost hundreds of thousands of dollars at the, at the least. Secondly, the cost of manning troops, tear gas, regular border patrols, even if you neglect the building of refugee camps, there's only so long you can hold them under terrible conditions without refugees acting violently against you, harming Belarusian citizens and raising security costs, but also forcing them into the border and having clashes with the border patrols of Poland and Lithuania was also itself massively expensive. So it's virtually impossible to force all these refugees to return. Many of them will stay in Belarus and become an additional burden on your state. So the first is there's billions in massive direct costs. Secondly, even more billions in wiped out trade. The direct effect is obviously relations with nearby trade partners like Lithuania and Poland that buy Belarusian petrochemicals and fertilizers have broken down and thousands of Belarusians are out of a job in manufacturing and services. Additionally, the income effect is that this is also extraordinarily expensive for the countries that would otherwise trade with you. So again, Lithuania, Poland, or Ukraine all have to spend money on this and have less money to trade with Belarus even if they wanted to. So this shuts down trade networks and any sort of mobility to and around the country, not only with the countries you directly harm, but also other countries that shut down flights with you because they are afraid of refugees entering their country, which why the majority of European and Central Asian airlines are being pressured to stop any and all flights to Belarus, harming your export economy, your ability to benefit from medicines, and the damaging domestic supply lines, costing you billions even more in damages. Thirdly, nasty is that this has invoked sanctions. The US made it clear it will not lift sanctions and has even doubled down in some of Belarus's key export industries. Flagging the material I said earlier, more specifically, frozen assets of high-ranking officials and important state-owned enterprises takes away not only their ability to provide utilities for people, causing rolling blackouts and a loss of access to clean water and public transportation. This has also massively improved, uh, increased the tax burden and incidents on the populace, meaning that people are substantially poor, have less money to spend on other things that they care about. What does this mean for the debate? One, people are much poorer. They have less access to social services, less trade for basic Belarusian industry. They're more likely to have, be out of a job. Two, the loss of important services that people care about due to companies staying in the country because sanctions froze the asset of Belarusian corporations and the instability made stock prices plummet. And thirdly, that even if you see this debate from Lukashenko's perspective, this has made him less popular in the eyes of the general populace and oligarchs who rely on wealth because it's been seen as a trivially failed strategy. This argument is important, one, because it strikes at the heart of the most direct harm and the most direct concern that people have on the ground in Belarus, namely putting food on the table, namely being able to provide for a future for these children that outweighs any potential reputational damages that people may face on negative bench or some, I don't know, pride or whatever. But secondly, in addition to this, it's not just the short-term harm economically, but also the long-term damages will create systemically to the Belarusian economy with its trailings with other countries. It means that like, you know, many companies will leave and people will no longer have the job, so they won't have the money to start up companies on their own. They won't have the capacity to do things like invest in further industries, which means that you're likely to create systemic poverty for the long term, creating massive harms for the for the, you know, all of time for Belarus. This is a massive mistake, and that's why it was terrible. Third thing, lastly, is that this has also threatened the security of Belarus. There are three reasons why. One, the border crisis may indeed transition into a fallout conflict, not only because there's extensive violence amongst refugees and amongst migrants between them and clashes with the police, bleeding into border towns, since they themselves armed the immigrants that are discontent with Belarusian action. This also there's also the risk of increasing conflict with the border patrols of other countries like Lithuania that perhaps is, is somewhat unlikely to create a full-blown war. But the matter of fact is that such a consequence of a full-blown war is so grave that the, like, the expected value of such a thing, even as small, is incredibly dangerous and should not ever be risked. Secondly, this also risks invoking the wrath of NATO. Poland is a NATO member state and the potential use of an exercise of mutual defense may cause this to simply be shut down and fail totally. You also risk the increase of American involvement as well, especially due to con condemnation that they've received from Biden. Thirdly, and also this, lastly, this has increased interdependence on a resentful Russia. One, manufacturing the refugee crisis has invoked the anger of the Kremlin because of one, instability in Russian trade partners and instability in the Middle East, which Russia has tried to stabilize in order to have buffer states. Two, it has soured relations with countries Russia is trying to curry favor with, namely Poland and Lithuania. And thirdly, it stalled Russian economic projects in Eastern Europe, e.g. the building of natural gas pipelines that are incredibly important to Russian oligarchs. So this means that you are substantially likely to get worse trade deals. You're not even likely to get the good deals, presuming that they would move more to Russia because they're deeply unhappy with you and because they're trying to punish you. At the end of the speech, it is clear, for like a bajillion reasons, affirmative wins on face. I think the uh, first affirmative speaker and welcome first negative.
Oh, okay. One moment. I'm going to start in three, two, one. Firstly, I'll do one piece of rebuttal, and then I'll provide some setup on who we think the actor actually is and what their interests are. And then secondly, we'll explain why the set of actions that Belarus has taken is in the interests of the actor. So firstly, on just one extraneous piece of rebuttal, I think it's interesting that the counterfactual they offer was, well, Belarus will do nothing and then the EU will raise the sanctions because they explain, like they tell you what, the, what is true, which is the EU placed sanctions on Belarus because of the, um, because of Lukashenko's actions in suppressing the election, enforcing his opponent to leave the, whatever, to leave the country, et cetera, falsifying and rigging that election. Why then would the, the EU just raise those sanctions after Belarus does absolutely nothing? Presumably the EU doesn't like Yukoshenko very much for a variety of human rights issues. It's been a pain and a thorn in their side on that, on that particular front for decades. It's unclear why them doing nothing would mean the EU would raise those sanctions. So at the first level, their comparative, their, their counterfactual doesn't make logically sense. Like why would the EU feel the pain enough to want to remove those sanctions? So firstly, onto the point of setup. The first thing we're going to do is ask here is who is the actor? There's obviously some contestation around this. We think it's best characterized as Lukashenko and more broadly the regime and government uh, surrounding him. And we think that's obviously because he controls Belarus. He is really that state and that regime is that state. And importantly, right, like when you look at the words in the motion, it's like this house as Belarus regrets manufacturing the crisis. So we're talking about the actor that manufactured the crisis, which is the political leadership of that country. And we'd also point out that when we do actor debates about other nations, it pretty much always becomes about the particular government and like what is in their particular interest, et cetera. We think it's probably not quite legitimate for, Aft, for Neg to try and claim that like the entire populace of Belarus or something, uh, you know, manufactured this crisis and they regretted benefiting or whatever. They regretted, regretted doing it. So, given it's likely to be the ruling regime that's the actor in this debate, what does that regime want? We think the first thing that that regime wants is likely wants to remain power. And broadly, there's just like kind of political stability within, within um, Belarus, suppressing those independence movements against, etc. And the second thing it wants is an end to those EU sanctions. And in particular, like Lukashenko and his group of guys want the end to those sanctions that target them. And the reason why this action works is it kind of serves two purposes. The first purpose it serves is it demonstrates, for reasons I'm going to get into, why uh, sanctioning Belarus is more trouble to the EU than it's worth, right? So it gets the EU off their back by like pressing a pain point for the EU and convincing EU to slowly begin to end sanctions. So I'm definitely not applying more. The second thing we point out is it kind of demonstrates to Putin, it demonstrates to Vladimir Putin, right, because Russia is the other kind of big bear in the room here, that, and it demonstrates to Russia that uh, Lukashenko is someone who can be trusted and is anti-EU. And there's a particular point of nuance here that I want to get to, which I think is quite important understanding the geopolitical calculus this actor has to make, because it's quite delicate. Russia and Belarus often obviously have a very long history, and you know, Belarus is to a certain extent something of a vassal state of Russia, but importantly, it's a vassal, it's not, it's not, it wants to be an autonomous vassal and maximizes autonomy as much as possible while realizing that it needs to rely on Russia for support in fending off the hostile West, right? Because Lukashenko it was an old school, like before the fall of the Iron Curtain uh, communist, he does not like the West, he wants to maintain power within that nation, and importantly, right, and, but, but importantly, by the same token, also doesn't want to get too close to Russia because Putin does have some long-term interest in maybe trying to absorb Belarus and control what Belarus does more. So Lukashenko has to perform this delicate balancing act in terms, and the regime more broadly, has to perform this del delicate balancing act where they, you, they need Russian support and they need to get the EU off their back for some things, but they can't get too close to Russia. And so what they needed, right, at this particular point in time was a show of power. A power play that increased their leverage upon both parties and allowed them to be able to, you know, not, you know, allowed them to be able to like demand particular concessions from Russia or at least limit the concessions they had to make in order to get Russian support and in turn get the EU sanctions away. 
why is this the case? And so I'm going to begin now with explaining the first argument here, which is why the set of actions achieve that goal. So the first thing we point out is that this was moving a couple of thousand refugees to the border and putting a lot of pressure and being in a very public way on Poland and the EU. It was not like a massive military engagement. It was not, you know, like none of, um, you know, the security forces haven't really done, experienced any casualties on the Belarusian side, side etc. All of which means that it's a relatively costless thing. It's not like you're spending enormous amounts of blood and treasure to do this, but it effectively flares up internal tensions within the EU. Why is that so? First reason, the key, the first thing it does is that it, it amps up conflict between EU and Poland, because EU and Poland don't get along. There's some history here, obviously, with the fact that Poland, the Polish has become increasingly anti-EU in its stand, stance, like the Polish government has stacked the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has asserted that Polish law hold, in some areas holds supremacy of the EU law, which contravenes, obviously, membership within the EU. They obviously also outlawed abortion, which is in controversy of, of the EU constitution and things like that. And also, forcing these refugees onto the border prompted the response from the Polish, who are very anti-immigrant, to be them up, right? Like that's what happened among large parts of the border. You had people and you had Polish border forces beating those guys up. And as a result, what you see, right, is those two countries in increasingly, you know, not getting along and flaring up that other issue. The second thing it does here is that it reignites and kind of, again, pushes against the biggest crisis that EU has struggled to face in the past couple of years, which is that kind of refugee crisis the management of migrants on the EU border, right? So post-2014, 2016 refugee crisis, the EU became noticeably more anti-refugee. <coughs> right there began Frontex, a series of right-wing governments won, I think the AFD and Le Pen, or Le Pen became more prominent, AFD won more seats. And the EU kind of has, in general, clearly a strong history of paying Turkey, et cetera, as they tell you. The problem is obviously that the Schengen Agreement kind of in theory guarantees movement between EU, EU nations, which is why, and the reason why it was so, it, it, this was such a sticking point was because a lot of countries didn't want refugees. And so I had to shut up you know, makeshift borders to try and prevent refugees from moving around and broadly apply pressure on various nations to do this, to, to, to stop refugees coming in. All of that adds up to this, right? The EU itself now has, a, has, has the EU itself has a variety of political parties, all of whom want to make this conflict go away and make this rolling news story of migrants constantly being on the Polish border go away. Why is that so? Firstly, there are legislative parties in the EU legislature that have Polish blocks and want this to go away and definitely don't want any further relations with Poland because that damages their ability to do this. Secondly, other people want to stop infighting because they want to be able to form political coalitions to other things. The legislature wants to focus on other things, which means they want this issue to go away. Secondly, they're increase, increasingly sensitive to coverage of this issue in the international press, which tends to go, yes, this is bad from Belarus, but EU still can't solve this problem. And it's very hard to know what your response is. Like, it's difficult to say yes, because that's politically unpopular for a whole range of actors that he was accountable he's difficult to say yes to accepting these migrants because that's politically difficult for, for a bunch of for, to a bunch of eu actors but it's also very publicly embarrassing to say no we can't accept these migrants we're going to force you back we're going to beat you etc so that explains why it creates a lot of pain for the EU and why they're likely to scale down their sanctions. Because at the end of the day, Belarus is not an existential threat. It's a small nation that, uh, that the EU you know, kind of doesn't like, but occasionally has to deal with. This makes it more trouble than it's worth. Secondly, with this, allows, this allowed Belarus and the Lukashenko regime to demonstrate their allegiance to Putin, obviously because it's a high form of hybrid warfare against the EU and Putin is increasing the EU. Secondly, it takes away attention from EU's maneuvers in the Ukraine. And then secondly, obviously Putin also has an interest in wedging Poland and the EU. These all serve the interests of the actors, and doing nothing would would get would like result in the sanctions continuing, you remaining weaker, and you being more reliant on Russia, and you having to make future military concessions to Russia in the future, or you have to do something else in order to get the EU off your back and win more Russian support to compensate for the sanctions, which of course weakens you. I think even if this debate was about the people of Belarus, increasing Russian control of Belarus and increasing Russian control of the fate of the people of Belarus is probably a harm. So even if you accepted their, believe it, who the actor was, it's probably worse for people of Belarus in the long run. They never explain why sanctions would go away under their side. We explain quite clearly how to serve the political benefits of the ruling government of, Be of, of Belarus, and that's why we take it. I think the first negative, second affirmative. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Uh, actually, I'll move my mic a bit closer. Um, I'll start my speech in three, two, 
one. So the first thing I want to note is that this debate on context, one, they will immediately lose if you do believe that Belarus is not Lukashenko, i.e. that this is an entire country with a general populace that has an entirely different interest. But even if it was just Lukashenko, I think there are limited reasons as to their characterization of Lukashenko's keys to power, why he is able to benefit off this crisis. I would argue three reasons that even if you can get the EU to ensure that they will like, you know, rest their sanctions, it is still incredibly unpopular for Lukashenko to pursue. The first is that, at best, they say oligarchs don't really like sanctions. I want to note a few things as a consequence. The first is that there has been no indication that the EU was willing to encourage sanctions. I'll explain later on why it is incredibly unstrategic for the EU to kowtow to any of what Belarus is attempting, but that there's an increased cost that it is exclusive to their side entirely of having to instead focus your money and resources not into trying to pay off the people that are close to you, but instead trying to put border patrols in the military, trying to ensure you are paying for incredibly expensive commercial flights that don't even take on many refugees per flight, and therefore is an incredibly expensive and clearly desperate solution from Lukashenko. Secondly, this has significantly strengthened opposition groups, because insofar as many people might not have been willing to oppose an authoritarian regime in the instance that this authoritarian regime might have done something to them, insofar as they've been more so pushed to poverty because of a lack of basic services, because of a lack of trade, because the EU has tightened their sanctions as a response to this kind of crisis, it makes it more and more likely people are going to oppose Lukashenko's regime at their own personal cost because they have had no other alternative since the country continues to get poorer and poorer and poorer. But lastly is that I don't think the EU has just in open arms taken on all these refugees. I know that Poland borders Belarus. And therefore, the risk not only of a bunch of refugees that have seen Lukashenko and the Belarusian attempt to create a crisis as one of betrayal because they were not promised the safe haven that they were initially promised because it was seen as manipulative to them and what their interests are. This is a significant border crisis that is more likely to harm Belarus than it is Poland, not only because there are greater Polish military resources because of EU support, as well as Poland becoming like, you know, being rather a NATO member state. It also just means that the people that are most likely to manage, like part of this crisis, are most likely to feel that anger and opposition towards Lukashenko. Next, they talk about Russia. The first thing I want to ask is, are they even able to curry Russian favor to begin with? Because if this is something Russia had wanted to just tear the EU apart, then I don't know why they would not have done that already on their own with all the different resources that they have had. There are many reasons this is something that already angers Russia. The first is that this is a very rare and very new kind of rogue, tac rogue state tactic which means that this is a potential threat and makes Belarus a very dangerous state insofar as maybe a lot of the things Russia might impose on Belarus might happen. Russia will be quite angered by the fact that this is a tactic that can be used against them as well. And therefore, they are less likely to support Belarus. This is an incredibly large harm insofar as majority of Belarusian trade already exists with Russia. It's not that Russia will be afraid and therefore they would want to like listen to Belarus even more. It is that they will try and stop this crisis from continuing to happen, strip the tools of Belarus and ensuring that this is going to be used in the future and ensure that it cannot be used against them. And note that because of the closeness of Russia to many Central Asian states, this also poses a risk to them. Secondly, Russia needs EU relations still. One, because these you know, many powerful nations in the EU and their involvement within conflicts in Central Asia are likely things that would, they would prioritize to be able to have stability and ensure that there are no future crises in these kinds of areas, which is why in places like Syria, Russia has tried to actively work with the US, France, and Germany in order to ensure greater stability because they do not want an increasing amount of instability. That's why they support authoritarian regimes, not because they fuel conflict, but because they provide stability within these areas. The second thing to note here is there are many Eastern European states that Russia is still trying to curry favor with, i.e. Lithuania, Estonia, many Slavic nations, and you know, as they mentioned, Poland, that if they see Russia as actively trying to fuel a border crisis, wherein they might have to take some brunt of the cost, wherein they, who have been following the rules for so long, now have to be able to take the brunt of the conflict, it's unclear why they would want to listen to Russia moreover. But thirdly, first Neg says that you don't, like you want to keep Russia at an arm's length. You want to ensure that they will increasingly try and encroach on you. So in so far as I prove that the threat of being able to do this against Russia is one that Russia can easily quell, the second thing to note is that in so far as you have completely cut off relations in trade with many other states, this all the more increases Russian dependence because of the strength of sanctions. And not only is this an economic political argument, 
obviously trying to open up like borders in order to encourage trade is a risk because you're playing with these borders and trying to manufacture a refugee crisis. So it's not just, you know, they're mad at them and therefore they'll sanction them. Any country that tries to trade with Belarus now has to open up borders and therefore there's a risk of security threats to them that they would not want to engage with. And that's important because more than Russia, there are many other nations that Belarus tries to trade with that are not very pro-Russia, i.e. Ukraine, to an extent Poland, etc. Next, they say that this is good in being able to convince the EU to end sanctions. The first thing I want to note is, this assumes that this threat was so big for the EU to like deal with, such that it was worth it for them to just backtrack and say, you know what, we'll listen to you, Belarus. The first thing I want to note is that the EU is like not just widely taken on all these different refugees, right? In fact, what I'd make like the, the claim I would make here is that not only does the EU have these structures to ensure you can disperse the cost of refugees, it is also the fact that this is something that they do not want to encourage in the future. Because as David points out, the moment an Urban does this, the moment that another country does this, it seems like it is an effective political tool in trying to get the EU to not do things to you. And therefore, bowing down now is not just a cost in the present, but it can potentially be a very, very large economic cost in the future because of the precedence of this, uh, that this creates as a consequence. But secondly, is that this is becoming increasingly more and more difficult. Not only are there just a finite number of refugees who are going to like, participate in this, a lot more of them are recognizing that many are starving and hungry at the border of Europe rather than being saved and promised heaven. Secondly, is that many of the countries involved have refused to work with like Belarus and therefore have made it increasingly costly and increasingly difficult to do this to a great extent, which therefore means maybe at the start, this is something the EU was panicking about and had difficulty dealing with. But at the present, this is not a big enough threat because it is getting harder and harder to do and therefore is a short term, short sighted blunder that I think well, Lukashenko has manufactured. What that proves is if the EU knows they can weather the storm now and not encourage further like, you know, actions like this in the future, they're more likely to do that rather than just kowtow now and therefore have an incredibly large future cost. The next thing I want to note here is it's a complete misrep to say they will just do nothing and sanctions will be lifted. What David explains is that it's much more likely small democratic reforms, releasing prisoners, which is the specific reason they were sanctioned, is far easier for Lukashenko than trying to bear the cost of all these other things. Maybe he loses some power, but is not definitely to the same extent that he will lose power as a consequence of this action. Lastly, they claim that this divides the EU. The first thing I want to note is that the matter is very old, i.e. people like Le Pen have both moderated since 2016 and are losing power and foothold because the stability that many leftists or at the very least center kinds of leaders have provided in the middle of a pandemic has seemed to be incredibly important like Merkel. But secondly, at present, I think the, um, the EU border crisis is not one that they have just, again, actively try to take on all refugees too. In fact, I'd make the argument that the far-right parties are not going to say we should stop taking on refugees and give Belarus what they want. The far-right parties are going to say countries like Belarus that are trying to use, send refugees into our border are evil because of their association with refugees in that extent. And therefore, even if they get stricter with refugees, it doesn't mean they get any more light on Belarus as a consequence. It's not clear why these kinds of parties are benefit to their side as well. For all these reasons, terrible strategy, short-sighted, big blunder, very proud to propose. I think second affirmative, second negative. Second negative. Sorry. Just wading through seas and seas of paper, feeling bad about the environment, all that good stuff. All right, I'll begin my speech in three, two, Firstly, dealing with the case where Lukashenko is the actor in this debate and the responses that we get at second negative, uh, second affirmative. They tell you a couple of things. They tell you, look, yeah, he may want to have 
remain in power, but there was cheaper ways for him to do this. He could have given up a few prisoners, for example, and avoided all of this problem. We argue that that is in direct tension with the exact mechanism that they use in their speech about how actions that Lukashenko does can greatly increase energy against him from opposition groups. And an action such as this, making him look so weak as to instantly bow down to a simple economic sanction from the EU would have absolutely had those exact same effects, right? Because if he didn't, so it just doesn't make sense as someone who wants to keep power to randomly just cave at the first sanction that happens to you when you have a whole toolbox of things available that you could choose from. And we would argue that even if you evaluate this debate from the perspective of the people of Belarus, that they know this too, that they know that Lukashenko is not willing to give up his power for anything. They know that he will fight back with expensive responses that are likely to ruin their economic livelihood no matter what, right? And they know that it's probably going to be one version of the economy getting fucked over or another version of the economy getting fucked over. Other alternatives that the public are likely to believe Lukashenko would use would be like inviting Russian troops into Belarus to scare, you know, states within the EU or maybe like staging nuclear missile tests and things that would equally aggravate sanctions and equally aggravate problems with trade that would equally upset their economic lives as citizens. So as citizens of Belarus who have had this crisis take place, it just doesn't make sense that they would regret it because they're all right right now. Like a lot of the analysis that that off, that they offer to you on the affirmative, that they're upset about it and they really wish that Lukashenko had done some other different crazy action is crazy because people in Belarus are okay right now and they don't think about the long-term economic impacts of the income effects because they aren't educated as to those issues right now they know that these refugees are being peaceful they don't actually like uprise in violence as they like to, to lie to you about on the negative team because firstly when in history have refugees ever behaved this way in a country when they have singly like single-handedly been pulled out of a conflict zone by that country and secondly refugees will do anything in order to get documentation and have no incentive to uprise against the people who are able to offer it to them right so people of belarus are not facing violence they're facing maybe a little bit of economic instability that they would have faced in either world and it's not necessarily true that their top priority as a nation is just to have economic stability right they care about other things so that wasn't enough for them to prove that Lukashenko or the people of Belarus would regret the action that has been take, taken let's look at the three responses they give us on Lukashenko which is like really not enough engagement when this is clearly what the debate is about the first thing they say is look there was no indication that the EU is willing to ditch sanctions and that means that it was really expensive to focus like money and resources towards supporting this border crisis. I think that this is ridiculous analysis. It is not that expensive to deploy a, a number of troops. Just to like back check you here, the number of troops coming from the EU side in this debate le like literally totals less than 20,000. It is a very small crisis. It's not an all out war. We aren't fighting attrition here. And the other economic harm that they bring you about like openness of borders didn't exist in the past tense anyway because it isn't a part of the EU there weren't ever open trading borders between Belarus and Lithuania that are now suddenly shut they weren't like previously not checking cargo that came off plane and scanning it for bombs and things because that was what they did with all international cargo that wasn't from a country that was within the EU the borders are equally closed to what they were before and trade is equally as easy or difficult in the same way that anyone who trades with Australia needs to pass its borders. It wasn't that hard to check cargo for like suspicious activity and it wasn't something that halted international trade. Otherwise, we would be living in a very different world if this economic analysis carried in this debate. The second thing they said is, look, it strengthens opposition opposition groups and Lukashenko is going to really care about this right he doesn't want a bunch of people to get angry at him because they might oppose his regime in like the future in a couple of years once they've energized and mobilized against him why would an actor choose like let me show that I'm extremely weak now by releasing a few prisoners let me not act against these sanctions if they were so worried about keeping their regime intact that they were thinking two years into the future of possible people mobilizing against them. But secondly, like the people of Belarus legit just protested in 2020 slash 2021. It was a hugely disruptive protest and Lukashenko survived it. So he's not too worried about them being mad at him because their quality of life is bad. He's been like in power since 1994 and he knows how to hold on to it. He knows how to shape elections so that he can stay in charge of them. And even in 2020, when he failed to shape those elections in his own favor, he still managed to re-relinquish power from those people. So that was not an incentive of this actor. 
the final thing they have here on Lukashenko is look, angry refugees will turn back on Belarus when their promise is broken. This was a ridiculous analysis of how any person makes a decision in their daily life, but also it flew in the face of the truth because less than five refugees in this entire refugee border crisis have even been displaced, like lost, like not tracked. I think only one or two of them have died, which is extremely low for a border crisis with refugees. And they're not angry. They're facing some of the best conditions that they could be as refugees trying to cross a border. But even if they were facing the worst, like think of the worst border crises with refugees that have ever happened, it's incredibly unlikely that they would believe that they have a chance of uprising against the entire country of Belarus and like stage a civil like refugee versus civil war in Belarus when they only have like 5,000 people in like in comparison to an, in, an entire country's army right like they know they're probably going to get shot and killed why would they rise up why would they behave violently absolutely no logical sense given from the opposition team in that uh, in that point so then looking at this argument that they have about this is short-term threat that is losing its teeth they're like you know look the eu will just weather this storm they're not going to bow down because they don't want to set a bad precedent like <laughs> diplomacy doesn't really work this way if precedent was the number one priority of the eu of any international actor when they were dealing with a threat to their you know to their sovereignty or dealing with an international threat, then nothing would have ever happened in the series of the world. Like World War One wouldn't have happened because we were worried about setting a precedent that another war could happen at some time in the future. The fact is sometimes important actions are needed in states of diplomacy when other international actors force you to do it. In the same way in the China motion that we all read, you know, we'd rather not make hostage deals with China, but sometimes we have to do it, even though it doesn't, you know, it may set a precedent, the immediate and pressing concern is more important to the actor. And that's that's why they were lying when they told you that the EU has made sanctions worse since this happened. They have actually reduced the sanctions upon Belarus. It has worked and it only needed to work in the short term. It didn't need to work in the long term because that was enough for Lukashenko to regain the power that he needed and to dodge some of these annoying sanctions that were bothering him. But let's talk about this economic devastation argument that they give us. They tell you that, look, doing nothing would have been better. We've already responded that that's crazy in both actors' point of view. They then tell you that direct costs of flights were expensive and that we we tell you that the that you know it was expensive to be sanctioned on the alternative anyway so an attempt to break free from those sanctions was more likely to have economic benefits over that they told you that this wiped out trade with lithuania and neighbors and this was magnified through the income effect and it made it expensive to trade with people we told you that the openness that they suggested existed prior to this action didn't actually exist they then told you that this invoked further sanctions and that it made russia incredibly angry we tell you that russia is literally in support of belarus in this action is supporting them with areas patrols is not mad at them and in fact would like likes pissing the eu off in general anyway and isn't really worried about it is sanctioned by the eu in and of itself right now so more lies that just don't carry at the end of this debate be realistic this is not how the world works it's a bunch of lies made to sound scary by someone who is trying to tell you what to believe about international relations thanks tiffany further uh hi just give me one sec. Oh, sorry if you can hear trumpets in the background. It's New Year's, so people are being loud. I guess Happy New Year's. Start in three, two, one. It goes without saying, but manufacturing a humanitarian crisis within your own borders is the worst strategic blunder a state could ever make. And to say that it was a good strategic decision is honestly despondent from the world. I think the fact that the responses to our case at second, at this point, are to assert that the people of Belarus are fine, that refugees aren't rising up against border patrol, and assert that sanctions are being lifted by the EU, shows just how much their case have crumbled. You know, those people of Belarus who for decades have been suffering under deteriorating economic conditions you know, those refugees who are angry because they were forced to live in the cold outside without any basic necessities and had no other choice but to resort to violence to get what they want because they were being de denied by the Belarusian border patrol of the very most basic things. I want to talk about three things to just demonstrate why the case collapses. The first thing I want to talk about is what the interests of Belarus actually are. Then I want to talk about who suffers most from the fallout of this crisis. And finally, how this impacts ties to Russia and our other allies. Let's begin with what the interests of Belarus are. 
They say this is from the POV of Lukashenko's administration. We say it ought to be from the perspective of the Belarusian populace. Importantly, they haven't engaged with our frame, but we explain from Miko why our frame encapsulates their frame entirely. Lukashenko will not be able to hold on to power for long if his domestic economy is in shambles, if supply lines are cut and the ability of his cronies to profit is deteriorated, and if conflicts are breaking out of the border because NATO is now pushing to isolate him. Many of the economic costs we outline, we directly impact to his administration, the freezing of their personal assets, the freezing of their ability to leave the country because of reduced access to flights, the shutting down of crony industries like natural gas and fertilizers that we outline from David. Our frame encapsulates theirs entirely. They've been entirely unresponsive as to what happens to the people of Belarus, other than to assert that they are fine for some reason right now, which means if you buy our case at this point, we've already won the debate. But importantly, I think they blatantly misrep our counterfactual. David was quite clear that Belarus would make certain concessions to the EU in order to waive sanctions, like the release of political prisoners. It's not like doing nothing. We think, and we explain this quite logically because it's in the interests of the administration. And I think there's a trick here we need to call out. They cannot conflate the interests of the Belarusian administration with the interests of Lukashenko alone, because he has keys to power that influence his ability to make these decisions. First, if you believe this debate is from the perspective of the populace, we explain why the concessions the EU was asking Belarus to make were actually good for the populace, why they would mean the return of certain civil liberties that allow for the increased access to trade, why they mean improved relations with other Eastern European states and the creation of jobs domestically. But second, we explain why they were good for Lukashenko and his keys to power, because at least they're able to maintain a steady supply of income. Importantly, if you think Lukashenko cannot hold on to power for long on either side of the house and his keys to power cannot continue to rely on him, the people in the administration cannot continue to rely on him, we give them a cushion of income they can continue to access to retain power in the future, even if there's a transition to democracy, they drag them down with, with Lukashenko and his administration. So from all perspectives, we quite clearly show why we're winning. Second question then, who suffers most from the fallout of this crisis? I want to be incredibly charitable and assume their frame. No, the burden on Neg isn't just to show that they hurt the EU, but to show why the pain they cause the EU is greater and more sustained than the pain Belarus itself feels. Uh, like game theory wise, if you're, you can't maintain your strategy for long, the other side just has to wait you out in order for you to cave. Their claim is essentially that this puts pain on the EU by making them look hypocritical and uncaring to refugees. The first problem with this is they fail to prove why Belarus has the capacity to make its portrayal the one that dominates global discourse. Like you can dom you can demonize the EU all you want. I'm not sure why the EU and the West, which control the vast majority of global media, will take on your interpretation rather than the more likely scenario as they do right now, where they say you are an irresponsible rogue state who is trying to put the lives of vulnerable immigrants at risk for their own selfish interests. Secondly, there's unresponded to analysis from David as to why this tactic loses teeth over time that we reinforce from Miko. The fact that refugees will stop going, the fact that airlines stop running this route, the fact that the EU is able to strengthen its border, build up walls and station more troops there, which means this becomes less of a pressing concern to them. Thirdly, the fact that this simply does not divide the EU, and if anything, it gives him an actor to point at as the common enemy, which is Belarus. So if you believe their claim that the actors in the EU you right now are looking for something to pin the blame on, you have given them a perfect alternative to pin the blame on, which is you, which is why they are unwilling to decrease sanctions and make it look like they're willing to concede to a rogue state if you believe this type of rise of strongman politics currently exists. What are the costs to Belarus? First, the people suffer. They assert that the people are okay. I think this is honestly just disingenuous. They've lived for years with a depressed economy compounded with the risks of COVID. People on the ground aren't able to make a living wage. There are increased security risks, both from the outbreak of immigrant violence, which by the way, doesn't have to be this concerted effort to topple the government. It just has to be an emotional, in the moment, a backlash to the horrible conditions you are being faced with because of the Belarusian military and the further strength of that military, which is now more free to crack down on you. The cutting of ties at the border, which means you have no longer any ability to leave or trade with other states. It wasn't enough for them to assert that you didn't have any ability to do this beforehand. Other, well, like, otherwise, like, obviously that isn't true because otherwise you wouldn't have these industries to begin with that would have allowed you to manufacture this crisis. The second thing we explain is that this costs Belarus so much just in terms of military spending. They say, oh no, it's small. It's only a couple 20,000 troops. No, this analysis knifes their own case. 
case. If the cost to you is small to maintain a military presence at the border, it's also small for the EU insofar as they don't have to match you to that extent. So there's no reason why they would buckle you under or buckle or decrease the sanctions on you. Importantly, we say it's about marginal costs and the fact that e the EU can escalate those costs for you far more than you can escalate those costs for the EU. The final thing we explain is the death of trade. And this leads me quite nicely into the last one. How does this impact our ties to Russia and our allies? At this point, we've proven this strategy is unsustainable. If it has not worked now, it is incredibly unlikely that it will work in the future. The final thing they tell us is at least we show Putin that we are a good ally and he is likely to come to our aid. I think it's quite telling that they abandon their defense of this at second. This falls for two reasons. First, you derail all of his ambitions in Eastern Europe. I don't think Russia cares as much about pissing off the EU in vague and asserted ways than he does about being able to continue the projects that benefit his oligarchs and his own keys to power, like the building of natural gas pipelines through Belarus and through other countries, which he needs access to the EU to do, which you have now shut down because you've closed borders, and like the fact that you've secondly now showed him that you are a volatile state where he once thought he had you under control and that he could rely on you on an al as an ally, you've now shown that you can manufacture domestic crises that you could potentially use against him to gain leverage against him in that way, which means he tightens his control on you and trusts you even less. But secondly, look at the host of unresponded to claims we give you about how this deteriorates relationships with the rest of Eastern Europe. Because if you are uncertain as to whether or not the EU would buckle on either side of the house, if you are uncertain as to whether or not Russia would come to your aid on the other side of the house. What matters then what this debate comes down to is your ability to maintain ties with other trade partners in that middle ground. States like Lithuania, states like Poland, which might be part of the EU once, but we're willing to be friendly to you in the past and trade with you and have some sort of economic relation. We say you, you appear as a threat to all of them and essentially isolate yourself from them because you have now shown that you have a tactic against them that they do not simply want to take on. This damages your population, this damages your hold on power, this causes so much instability and for those reasons affirm. I think the further from the speaker, third negative, please. Can you move all this? Sorry. <laughs> oh, can everyone now? Uh, oh, what's this view? Ooh, I don't like that. Okay, cool. Can I be seen in head? Yes, we can. Middle of this year, Lukashenko found himself in a truly dire position. There was huge amounts of domestic upheaval that threatened to throw him from power. There was a start of EU sanctions against his regime in the aftermath of the 2020 election that he rigged unsuccessfully. And thirdly, there had been aggressive attempts over a period of time by Western countries, particularly within the EU, to destabilize him. And the question you must ask then is in the midst of this turmoil, where it looked very likely that Lukashenko would lose power, was it ever credible that the counterfactual in this debate was that Lukashenko did nothing? or even worse, as is suggested later down the bench from the affirmative team, that he actively made himself look weak by releasing political prisoners, by easing up on the population, and by giving away what little control that he had. And the answer to that is obviously no. Obviously, he would have instead, if he could not engage in this very smart, very successful tactic, have engaged in cruder, more brutal, brutal methods of maintaining power that would have been far worse for the people of Belarus if you buy the affirmative team's frame, but also for him in his quest to maintain, maintain power in our more correct frame. We are going to win this debate in two very simple ways. Firstly, we're going to show that the counterfactual world in which Lukashenko did not attempt the strategy is one in which both the population of Ukraine and Lukashenko himself are far, far worse than they were at the start of the year. But secondly, we will explain that the world in which you do try the strategy, the status quo, is one where the trend for Belarus and Lukashenko has been positive, and therefore it is definitely not something worth regretting. So firstly, what is the counterfactual that he would have done? Obviously, he needed a way 
to show his strength. He needed a way to keep the EU away that sensed that they could squeeze him out with sanctions, that he was just about to topple. He needed a way to maintain power against the protesters on the streets who looks like they might overwhelm the security state apparatus. The answer to that is always things like further crackdowns. It's things like appealing to Russia and asking them to send in troops to assist. It's things like asking Russia to station nuclear missiles in Belarus, which notably they've offered to do in the past. All of these things, note, are very aggressive. It's often things like starting tensions on the border with other countries. Those are all standard ways that failing regimes attempt to buoy themselves, doing things like conflict that can bolster nationalism against countries, doing things like cracking down on the people, making them so scared that they're afraid to go out, and doing things like appealing to other bigger countries with bigger guns in order to keep your population in check. That is what side affirmative must defend, but it refused to do throughout this debate. And we explain that obviously all of the harms that they talk about and they think are so bad just occur far worse on their side then, right? Like obviously there would be far less trade in a world where this occurred because the EU would increase sanctions, right? It's unclear why the EU would just be like, oh, well, I guess our job's done. We're going to ease up on sanctions in this world. It is a world in which there's more border tensions because it looks like Belarus might be massing for some sort of conflict. It looks like they might assist in the invasion of Ukraine that Russia is currently planning for. It's one in which far more Belarusian civilians die because that is how you express that you are powerful. You kill the people who oppose you. You murder them brutally. You engage in that kind of crackdown. And that was obviously far worse for the civilians and people of Belarus. It was far worse for Viktor Lukashenko because he weakened his country and therefore his position versus both the EU and Russia. And that is why it was a counterfactual that was particularly bad. Let's then explain why, having explained that that is basically the worst possible scenario in this debate, we then win very clearly by defending the status quo, which we explain is in fact pretty clever. The first thing to do is just explain like what exactly the whole point of this strategy was. Like why did he manufacture this relatively complicated scheme? We explain that it's because he knows that the weakness of the EU is refugees. We, he knows that because in 2014, the EU was literally seized with internal tensions over a refugee crisis. He knows it's a weak point and he jumped right for it. And it immediately flared up a series of important tensions, right? Like the EU is very worried about Poland's abuse of human rights. For example, their bans on things like abortion, their treatment of political prisoners. And for example, um, the fact that their Supreme Court has overruled EU law and claimed that Polish law supersedes EU law. What does Poland do as soon as the borders come, uh, as the refugees come over the border? They start killing them and beating them, immediately proving to people within the EU that Poland is a rogue state, that it cannot be trusted. Secondly, in the 2014 EU crisis, there was a huge problem because the Schengen agreement that allows for free internal movement of labour and humans within the EU means that any one country letting in refugees means letting those refugees into all countries, which is why in the aftermath you saw so many right-wing parties elected like UKIP, like Matteo Silvini in Italy, and why you saw things like EU Frontex, the EU's border agency, be set up to keep refugees out. It's why you saw things like, for example, the EU paying Turkey billions of dollars to keep refugees in Turkey rather than letting them over the border. All of that reveals that this is a huge problem for the EU and one they're desperate to avoid, which explains why this gives Belarus and Lukashenko leverage to reduce sanctions. Their claim is just that, one, the EU wouldn't want to be seen as weak by loosening sanctions over time, so it would never do so. But we explain, one, they have a history of doing so. Like, literally, Turkey has blackmailed them and said repeatedly, we'll let the, the, the like, refugees over the border if you don't pay us more money. So we know that they're willing to cow, cow to this kind of threat in, in the past. But secondly, is it more or less credible than the alternative they present, which is, well, if you just do nothing, the EU will kind of get bored and decide they didn't want to sanction you to begin with. Obviously a ludicrous claim from them. But we point out to additional reasons that this would put lots of pressure on the EU, right? Like the fact that it causes the internal legislature of the EU to seize up. Because for example, Germany and Poland are both part of the Democratic People's Party, which is the main caucus within the EU. Poland being like seen as a rogue state puts pressure on those internal caucuses to exclude Poland and therefore changes the balance of power within the legislature, takes up time from other issues, like for example, Russia massing troops on the Ukrainian border, all of which means there'd be lots of pressure to get rid of this issue. And the EU easiest way to do that is to seize sanctions on Lukashenko and therefore have him stop, which explains why this was the fastest way for Lukashenko to dig himself out of the pit that he has. What does this team say in response in terms of like what harms this has generated? They give some of the most ludicrous harms I've heard. Of. One, the flights are expensive. Are you fucking kidding me? Like the hundred grand to charter a plane is the thing that's going to send Lukashenko over the edge. 
Secondly, they say the camps require soldiers and guards, which is expensive, as if the soldiers wouldn't exist in the counterfactual. You just move where they're stationed, they're already on the fucking border. But secondly, they're not having camps, they send them immediately over the border. They land the plane and they send them into Poland. They're in Polish border towns, not in Belarusian border towns, because the refugees want to go to the EU, which is nice, and not to fucking Belarus, which is a shithole. Are you kidding me? Lastly, they say there'll be like lots of lost trade to a nation that was already heavily sanctioned by all its neighboring countries. They then claim there'll be there's more sanctions that have occurred in the status quo. Factually incorrect. There's been no escalation. And in fact, it looks like sanctions are set to expire because this policy has been effective, because the EU wants it to end and wants to move on to bigger issues. They say this has increased border tensions. That's the whole fucking point. He's trying to stir up tensions in order to get this benefit that was not a harm. He then says this will make Russia mad because it reduces Russia's trade. Russia is one of the most heavily sanctioned countries. It doesn't affect their trade at all. If anything, it makes them more palatable because now you can't trade with Belarus. Secondly, they say it causes border tensions for Russia. The country preparing to invade Ukraine is worried about border tensions, apparently. Thirdly, they say it might be used against Russia, so Russia will worry. I don't think Russia cares about abusing refugees, so they wouldn't care about the threat of refugees being sent to their border. Their last claim is that this is unsustainable, which is factually untrue because refugees are likely to be very hopeful and very optimistic about this process. But even if that was the case, we say the policy has already worked. It was unclear you needed to do this forever. We've already seen the benefits apply. And the benefits were huge. It was good for a relationship with Russia because it showed fealty while distracting attention from Russia's invasion of Ukraine and making the EU look really bad, seizing up the EU preventing its capacity to respond to anything in the region, and it got sanctions lifted far faster than the alternative. Incredibly proud to win this debate. I think deferred negative speaker, negative reply. <laughs> One moment, sorry. Um. Right. <clears throat> Sorry. I literally have COVID, so <laughs> I'm just kind of a cough. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to start. In three, two, one. This reply will only ask one question. And the question will be is, which side improves the likelihood of EU sanctions being lifted? And the reason I'm kind of starting here is that no matter who you believe the actor is, either the kind of Lukashenko regime who started this crisis, or kind of more vaguely, the sort of interests of Belarus as a whole, both groups would like sanctions to be lifted. As first affirmative identifies, there have been a set of economic harms that have been associated with these sanctions. And broadly, you know, Belarus, no matter which actor you believe, would like the sanctions to go away, would like Belarus to stop being a source of negative headlines and would like more economic opportunity. And so if you believe that side negative kind of proves this would be a better course of action, or this was a sufficient course of action relative to any alternative that the affirmative offers, then you probably have to award us the round. So let's start with what they tell you here. They say that, well, Belarus's best bet was to release a few political prisoners and make some de democratic reforms. And we had two lines of response here. The first thing we point out is if you do believe, as you think you should probably attach some probability to, that the actor in this debate is the Lukashenko regime, then this was game over, right? He looked incredibly weak and opposition groups became emboldened and key political opponents were now free and no longer in prison to organize against him. It was incredibly likely, given the context of his political weakness, that cowing in that particular moment would not have helped extend the longevity regime and rather accelerated its demise. But the second line of response we have is we point out that Belarus was one, not a country that you cared about particularly economically, because Belarus is quite small, and that two, that you didn't like Lukashenko very much. In, in fact, because of the recent history here, they really didn't like Lukashenko. And they were unlikely to ease sanctions short of anything except complete regime change or him stepping away. And that means in this debate that their policy of like 
not do very much, maybe makes a few democratic reforms, either is the third rail and loses the debate if you believe that Lukashenko is the actor, but also is insufficient in terms of leverage over the EU to get the EU to reduce those sanctions. And given that both sides accept those sanctions started prior to this crisis becoming a part, because well, otherwise why else would Lukashenko uh, do this, this suggests that their alternative would not have caused very much benefit and would not have eased the sanctions, which they told you at first was the most important uh, harm in the debate. What do we tell you? We tell you that this puts pain on the EU and that pain would be kind of sufficient for them to think that sanctions were more trouble than they were worth. They say in response two things. Firstly, that this unites the EU in opposition to a common Belarusian enemy. And secondly, that they don't want to, that the EU doesn't want to set a bad precedent and encourage countries like Hungary to do this as well. Both claims here suffer from the same problem. And it's the false assumption the missing characterization around why the EU is a unitary actor that can act in a cohesive way in pursuit of common interests, especially on the question of migration. And that's where our analysis comes in. We explain that when it comes to migrants on the border, the EU is better analogized to a bag of feuding cats. And we point this out in kind of two ways. The first thing we point out is specifically with Poland, the crisis prompts a regressive and violent response from Polish border forces and Polish vigilantes. And that angers anti-Polish forces in the EU parliament and heightens domestic political pressure to further distance the EU from Poland. And that is a problem because there are other political actors who care about Poland. Secondly, we explain the question of migration puts the EU in a difficult position because there's substantial domestic and anti-migrant sentiment, but it's embarrassing to let these people go away and allocating where these refugees would go after you agree to accept them is the most thorny issue in EU politics. Their final response here, and that explains why there's enough pain, their last gasp here is like, oh, well, it's a really cost thing to do. We point out it's a couple of thousand refugees. It doesn't cost very much. You have to pay the soldiers anyway. And the risk of violence within Belarus is not very large, given that you have military superiority. We prove that the sanctions would go away. And this was the maximum leverage way to, for Belarus to maximize their leverage relative to their side. And that's why we have to take the route. Thanks, Nick. Reply, Af reply. Can everyone hear me? Yep. All right, great. Hold on. Right. I'll start my speech in three, two, one. So I think there's a desperate attempt at third neck to build an entirely new counterfactual. Not only do I think this should go without credit, there are three reasons it still loses. The first is that if all the differences are things that have already happened in the past, Lukashenko is trending always towards them. It is unclear why this meaningfully makes him more brutal when I think they already clearly outlined that this is already the nature of this regime. In fact, the second thing I'd want to claim is that if their main problem or Lukashenko's main problem is that he really needs these sanctions off his back, I don't know why this counterfactual that they say happens on our side of the house would have fixed that problem, it's unclear why he would have acted in that manner. But thirdly, this is a complete contradiction to second negative, who says he's been in power since 94, he can weather any kind of storm, he can take on any opposition, but suddenly a third negative, he's at this very, you know, desperate position that's very sensitive. If you believe that there is one or the other, you cannot believe any of the claims from either speaker. But that's why our counterfactual is a lot more convincing because it takes on a middle ground. He might want to hold on to power for a lot longer. And this is a much cheaper solution to release some prisoners to have some reforms rather than manufacturing a really costly crisis. And I think they have a fairly nuanced stance at first negative that gets less and less nuanced as the debate goes on. I.e., you want to convince the EU and you want to keep a like, arm's length relationship with Russia in order to ensure that they don't take your sovereignty. So does this convince the EU? I first want to note that they say that they'll divide the EU. At best, they say that there's also a bunch of populists, there's a bunch of right-wingers. They don't explain why these people being divided eventually leads to loosening like sanctions on Belarus. In fact, at best, this proves that they might tighten borders, they might be stricter on refugees, not that everyone, let's make sure Belarus is treated as nicely as possible. That was a huge missing logical gap in order to get their benefits. Secondly, they can't say this is cheap, because if it is just moving soldiers around, if it is that many refugees, 
why does the EU have to care that much? Because it doesn't have any kind of like economic power and leverage that they say it has if Belarus isn't willing to shell out that kind of cost. In fact, I'd say there are much more direct costs that Belarus has to point out because they bear the cost of transit, which they just assert it's really cheap to have a bunch of commercial airlines taking on a very few number of refugees over a pretty long period of time and don't really give a structural rebuttal to this. Moreover, like all the other response you give as to why it's expensive. There are these precedents. Second Neg says, this isn't how IR works, then refuses to explain how IR works. When we note that one, a lot of their context on right-wing populists, and we name as well Orban and Central Asian states that might be in this kind of position, would want to use this in the instance of EU cow cows to this kind of strategy in the future. And therefore, it's unclear why this precedent is not a convincing argument, when clearly this is not worth the risk when many people might use this against immigration or any other policies. So if this doesn't divide the EU or convince them to listen to Belarus at all costs, the first thing you have to note is I don't think they have a very compelling response to any kind of cost, because if it is not very costly, it also won't convince the EU. Secondly, is that we didn't just say that these sanctions will remain. We have explained why they have become tighter and why even without sanctions, countries have been incredibly unwilling to try and trade with Belarus out of fear of opening up their borders in general. They just give this glib response that you can check cargo and all that stuff. It's not clear as to why any other rogue action Belarus might engage in or to any kind of benefit. I know that all these things answers both, better for Lukashenko or better for the populace. They don't answer that until third neg with a very desperate counterfactual. Lastly, I also think the responses on our claims about Russia and why they might not like this are very glib, i.e. Russia doesn't really care if you're sending a bunch of refugees to the border, when that was never really our analysis. Not only is this a new tool that could be used against Russia, it also comes from places of Russian places of interest because they fear instability in the region. Moreover, it's not clear why Russia just wants to destroy the EU at all costs. Otherwise, they probably would have done this at some point before. It is that Russia needs to maintain a delicate balance and doing this not only makes you more desperate and therefore need to rely on Russia more, it also makes Russia more angry because not only do they have that increased leverage of desperation, but also the fear that they might do this to you, or rather Belarus does this to Russia, makes them more restrictive, makes them more controlling, does not achieve the nuanced stance they wanted on NEG. I'm very proud to propose. Thanks so much for much of reply. Do I get a breakout room?